This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. The Kaliapea Foundation envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other programs supported by Kaliapea include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit kaliapea.org. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. I think it's up to us to not be paralyzed by this. I think it's up to us to be, especially people who are, you know, in the high consuming parts of the world that are really responsible for this, to not be paralyzed. I just say we need to do the work that's, that's really ours to do to move through this. Today we are speaking with Corey Lesk. Corey is a PhD student in Earth and Environmental Science at Columbia University in New York. He works on the implications of extreme weather and climate change on ecosystems and global food production. Recently, he published research on southern pine beetle expansion into the north due to warming winters. Corey spends summers paddling in the boreal forest of Iyuchi and Mastuyash territories in so-called northern Quebec as a means to work on a more immediate and personal relationship with the ecosystems that are otherwise reduced to scientific equation in his field. Well, hello, Corey, and welcome to For the Wild, and thank you so much for joining us today. And I just wanted to say that in preparing for this interview, it has become really clear that the expansion of the southern pine beetle is a manifestation of our consumptive culture, a culture that we have been born into and yet have failed to dismantle the myths of to you know really address so many of these avoidable impacts you know instead many of us have gotten distracted by the promises of development technology and science but it seems to me that the southern pine beetles migration is a reminder that what we have yet set in motion cannot simply be stopped So I really look forward to this conversation with you on the effects of warming winters on pine forest and the implications of southern pine beetle expansion. Great. I'm looking forward to it. So I know that the southern pine beetle is native to Central America and the southeastern U.S., but over the past decade, these beetles have been spotted throughout the Northeast. It's been predicted that they will appear in Nova Scotia by 2020 and southern New England and Wisconsin by 2060 and other parts of Canada by 2080. So can you begin just by telling us what changes you are seeing in southern pine beetle expansion due to warming winters? And how did they get to where they are now? You know, what areas are predicted to become climactically hospitable to these beetles by the end of the century? The southern pine beetle is native to the southern United States and never really made it up to the northern United States. It's a big pest in the southern United States. They grow a lot of pine down there and very heavily managed forest for timber. Um, And it's been just a regular part of the disturbance regime down there, uh, wiping out the forest every now and then. But since around 2000, it started moving north and uh, made it into New Jersey for the first time and got very established there and has been a problem in southern New Jersey ever since. The forests down there are these coastal, kind of sandy, stunted pitch pines. It's a very iconic landscape for people from New Jersey and people from the East Coast in general in the United States. And it just causes pockets of of devastation that gradually expand. Uh, You know, it's these these things have never been part of this landscape before in the popular memory of this landscape. And now they're they're a persistent problem. And then since 2002, um, actually, in, in 2015, the southern pine beetle appeared on Long Island uh, for the first time and was infesting red pines out there and uh, is since then moved north into Connecticut and Massachusetts, where there are some sort of stable populations up there. So people were uh, puzzled by why this beetle was dispersing up into these places that get these cold winter extremes that don't happen in the south and the connection has long been hypothesized between the ability of this insect to survive and the cold climates of the north, especially the really cold winter nights. And so kind of what we wanted to do in this project was to uh, examine that relationship and see if we could use 
kind of the spatial information in southern pine beetles northward march uh, and the changing winter cold extremes and see if we could make a projection about whether these these little beetles would continue to move further north. I know that southern pine beetles have been labeled, quote, the most destructive insect pest of their forest. That was quoted by the USDA Forest Service. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate more on their so-called destructive behavior, because I know that these beetles have been responsible for an estimated $1.7 billion loss in timber from 1990 to 2004. But this, of course, is just an economic quantification. You know, it's reflective of society's tendency to reduce nature to natural resource. So really, how serious is pine beetle expansion and migration to the totality of the forest ecosystem? and community, you know, outside of the timber industry. And what exactly does the southern pine beetle do to pine trees? Southern pine beetle uh, is an eruptive uh, insect. So it um, it's not always around in a problematic or devastating quantity. Sometimes, for reasons that are not fully understand and probably partly coupled to the, to the weather and climate variability, they just produce a ton of successful offspring and uh, those offspring devastate the trees. So the way that they reproduce is they burrow under the bark of pine trees. They're generalists among most pine species. And then they lay their eggs under there and the larvae hatch and they spend the winter under there. And then in the spring, the larvae grow and, and mature. Um, and then they uh, chew their way out through the tree and fly onto the next tree. And their ability to attack a tree really depends on uh, the quantity that's around. So they they get into these eruptive phases of their population. And then in those phases, they can cause, you know, near total mortality over patches that are, you know, a kilometer or more in size. Um, And then the patches will occur across the landscape in varying densities. And when you have trees dying on the landscape, and that has all kinds of, of consequences, for one thing, other trees are going to start to grow in in their place, and they won't necessarily be the same trees. Usually, you'll get kind of successional species rather than the pines that tend to be the mature trees that only come through after a, a while after a disturbance. Um, but before those trees get established, you now have this kind of dead landscape where the soil is bare. Uh, there's no leaf keeping the heavy rainstorms from washing away the soil. So there's a there's an erosion and water quality consequence, which obviously uh, will affect the subsequent plant growth, affects uh, the entire downstream aquatic ecosystem, and then uh, also our drinking water quality. And also pines don't stand alone. They're completely enmeshed in the whole ecosystem. And, you know, there are lots of bird species that um, feed on pine seeds and other small mammal, as well as some endangered species of or endemic species of uh, butterflies and other insects. So yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, in this paper, we talk a lot about or, or our upfront motivation is the, the timber costs. But you're right, that's a bit of um, it's a bit of the wrong thing to pay attention to here. And we, we can move on to other kinds of economy. But you know, insects that depend on this forest are Uh, They they don't necessarily have other places to go. One thing that I've thought about too, and I know there's a lot of mixed thoughts on forest fires and that, you know, obviously there's a lot of fear around forest fires, but there's also a lot of myths and misinformation around the, quote, naturalness of forest fires. So, you know, thinking about these such large swaths of acreages that are being affected by pine beetle, I'm thinking about these infected forests, you know, they could also dry out and burn, which of course endangers people's property and emits large amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. So what are your thoughts around, you know, how forest fires interact with these dead standing trees? There's some kind of link and it's debated, but generally on the East Coast, forest fires are much less of a problem than they are on the West Coast. And that's just because it's so, so much more humid out here. So... I think the connection is stronger on the West Coast, where there is a close cousin of the southern pine beetle, which is the mountain pine beetle. And that was famous in the last uh, 10 years or so because it hopped the Rockies. It used to be on the 
the, towards the sea from the Rockies and uh, would kind of move up and down the slopes with harsher or milder winters. Um, but it could never make it up and over the slopes across the summits down to the leeward side of the mountains and often to the you know, vast interior boreal forests in Canada or into the montane forests in, in the U.S. Rockies. And it recently, in the last 10 years, jumped that boundary and has become a huge problem across a wide area where there was never mountain pine beetle before. I don't know a lot about the connection to fire there. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's something that's, that's considered a huge additional risk. Probably the largest factor is the drying soil moisture and the just, you know, decadal drought that's been going on, especially in California, where fires have been really out of control the last few years. Some kind of connection, I, I would say, but I don't think it's the most important thing that's been driving them. I'm wondering about this thought of by severing these nutrient flows, the southern pine beetles can kill their tree host within just several months. So I'm wondering, how does this shift the forest structure? And how do you see forest type ranges shifting? You know, is there a possibility that these shifts will be conducive to pine beetles? And in some ways, will climactic change empower certain species who, by luck of adaptation, are able to participate and survive great migration? This is definitely something. So, the, I mean, there's a there's a focus on doom generally in the climate impacts uh, world, and it's true that there are potentially hidden resiliences and resiliences we don't pay a whole lot of attention to as we're drawn to these potential risks more, I guess. But of course, you know, climate change creates opportunities for species as well, and you know, it's a great opportunity for southern pine beetle to to expand up the whole coast. Of course, that's not good for the pines. You mentioned what would take over the pine, how that would uh, change the distribution. And you're completely right that there's this whole climate change going on over over a century kind of time scale that's affecting the forest composition as well. We didn't really consider that directly in our research because trees propagate across the landscape very slowly. If the seed can survive in what used to be too cold and now is pleasantly warm for that kind of seed, well, it's only going to move as far as maybe the wind can carry the seed or gravity can carry the seed. Or maybe if you're lucky, a squirrel will bring that seed somewhere, or a bird will transport it, which is not really that far, maybe a few kilometers. Um, whereas southern pine beetle has been observed to dis disperse on updrafts and carry itself through the wind. These things are, you know, the size of a pinhead, basically, maybe at most a millimeter long and they're very light. So they can disperse very quickly. And they can get where they need to go and really colonize it quite fast. So the, the time scale at which southern pine beetle dispersal is happening uh, is so fast that it makes the, the change in forest ranges across the landscape seem relatively irrelevant, I think. As for what's going to uh, replace the pine, um, we're not totally sure what the level of devastation the uh, southern pine beetle will bring in newly colonized areas. The population dynamics are and the and the interactions between species are vastly complex. The the climate system is relatively simple compared to how complex the biology and ecology are there. And so it's possible that there will be no pine in this landscape because the southern pine beetle will just colonize any tree and take it out. And what'll take its place will be, you know, what's adjacent and what can take advantage of that of those gaps that are created where there used to be pine. And that could be oak or maple or beech. Um, or it could be nothing up in, in the rocky summits of the Adirondacks. The reason that there are pines around there is because those are the trees that are that can survive and there's there's not that much else. Definitely an open question. And um, our landscapes are changing and will change more uh, from the interactions of all kinds of things in climate change directly and climate change percolating through the, the vastly complicated ecology that makes our land look the way it does. Mm hmm. I was thinking about how regional biodiversity will be threatened. So often when we think about the loss of biodiversity, it's attributed to intensive land use or pollution or, you know, over exploitation. Imagery of these large scale destructive forces, say in the Amazon, is evoked in our minds. But beetles, while being driven by climate change, are, you know, just a much more inconspicuous force. Yet they are threatening butterflies and insects and birds who rely on pine forest. 
And, you know, I'm thinking of this um, specific example of southern pine beetles damaging coastal pitch pine forest, which support rare and threatened ecosystems and birds that depend on pitch pine seeds for survival. And it's said that pitch pine forests are expected to face significant risks in the next 35 years. So how do you see this cascading effect, you know, affect these forests when and, and all the species that are growing uh, simultaneously with the pines? So th that's an interesting question. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about lately is that um, not all ecosystems are are equally vulnerable to a changing background climate. And one thing that I think makes you more vulnerable is a, is a small, um, highly adapted, localized type of ecosystem which is which is basically what the pitch pine forests are like. Uh, they exist on the sandy, uh, glacial moraine, terminal moraine um, of the northern east coast of the United States before it just turns to rock uh, out in Maine. And those ecosystems uh, don't really have anywhere else to go. So they can't move north with the climate. And uh, if they get ravaged by southern pine beetle, they'll be even less uh, resilient to, to changes in climate. And so, you know, the, these, eco, these types of ecosystems like these, you know, Cape Cod pitch pine forests are things that a lot of people know very well from childhood. These are vacation places. These are forests that are beloved. And they're, these are the kinds of ecosystems that I think are most at risk because they're so specific and so localized. And that's part of what makes them charismatic, but also part of what makes them vulnerable. And then, uh, of course, you know, localized specific types of ecosystems always or often come with uh, their endemic uh, species that are equally charismatic and well known to us. In these later days we're making a living undertaking from each other all the things for which we have no See the people there on Friday At the barter fair say why pay Could you trade in this fine portrait for the shoes And I know that I don't know you well But holding your hand I could tell that if I I know the research of southern pine beetle expansion you and other scientists were a part of factored in a variety of ecological uncertainties. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate which uncertainties were accounted for and why. And more specifically, do you know if the beetles will be successful in colonizing pine species they've never seen before? Will drier climates or changes in fire regimes influence pine trees' vulnerability to the beetles? There's a, there's a kind of uh, layer cake of of pine species that dominate uh, as you're looking at the map of the eastern half of North America. And the, the main species in the middle, kind of middle north of the United States, uh, in the Appalachians, and then up the coast is pitch pine. And then north of that is red pine. And that goes across the Great Lakes and then, you know, through the, the Adirondack and uh, Green Mountains and across Maine out to the Canadian Maritimes. And then north of that, red pine can't survive the, the boreal cold of central Quebec and central Ontario, and then you get into the jack pine. And uh, red and pitch pine are, are hard pines, and that's, that's the kind of bread and butter of uh, southern pine beetle. It's, it's well adapted to hard pines, that family of pines. And so those are the ones that uh, people who work closely with these forests are most worried about. And one of the co-authors on this study works uh, in his full-time job is working on uh, forest. He's a forest entomologist. He works on the risk that insects pose to United States forests. And he's, he's assigned to the East Coast. Uh, and so he um, 
he's very interested in and works closely with Southern pine beetle, this, this tiny little critter. Um, and what he's found is that out on Long Island, which is for the most part suburban and has all kinds of pines that were planted, even ones that aren't uh, native, um, but also white pines, which are soft pines, so com from a completely different family with different kind of tissue structure and different physiology, the southern pine beetle seems to have absolutely no problem becoming established in those uh, species. But of course, this has only been going on since 2015. So, you know, it's hard to say whether they'll be able to really continue to reproduce in and expand from and infest new white pines or, or other, you know, different types of pine families that exist in the north. And then when you get into the boreal forest north of the red pine zone, where jack pine is dominant, we still haven't really observed any infestations there because it's it's a, a long ways off. But our model projects that these areas would be suitable for southern pine beetle between around 2050 and 2080. This is a huge problem in cli climate impacts on ecosystems is we know so little about how this complex relationship between climate and ecosystem really functions, especially on specific assemblages of species. And we know even less about how they respond to a long-term change in climate because we've never observed it before. This is not something that we have hundreds of years of, of science to go on. This is something that's happening day by day and that makes it so difficult to study. The data is so sparse and the changes are so complex and interacting. Um, so yes, there are very big uncertainties in terms of the uh, logical impact, but there are also uncertainties in on purely on the climate side. We, we tried to for the purpose of helping people who work with these forests understand where this uncertainty in climate projections is coming from, uh, we tried to parse out what our climate models were saying and the the, the uncertainty therein into its uh, different sources. So there are uh, the way that the people do climate projections is to use a suite of different climate models. These climate models are these giant computer programs. They're millions of lines of code. Um, and they just simulate everything going on in the oceans, in the atmosphere, at the land surface with the sun coming in and heat going out from the Earth's surface and all of the turbulence and all of the winds and currents. Um, and this is a huge project and different, different teams from all over, all over the world have built models and they all simulate the climate slightly differently. And when we're talking about human-induced climate change from greenhouse gas emissions, the way that we put that into the model is to use uh, emission scenarios. And these basically say, you know, do we think that we're going to continue to burn tons of fossil fuels at a growing rate off into the future, or are we going to radically mitigate climate emissions or uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the near future, or maybe something in between? And so when you run 20 different climate models with four different climate scenarios, you get a range of of different answers and that's part of the uncertainty that we wanted to parse out and it, you know it's important to understand where that uncertainty is coming from if you're trying to make decisions for uh the long term if you're managing a tract of forest in the united states for instance because when it comes to the greenhouse gas emission scenarios you know you can make an informed guess on what you think is going to happen in terms of our trajectory into the future you can also update your expectation as you know there are things like the Paris uh, climate conference with the intentions to reduce emissions coming from national governments. And then the uh, differences between climate models kind of represents the state of the science, um, the representation of the physics and how that evolves over time. So it gives you a kind of basis for saying, how sure are we about what parts of this uh, kind of predicting and you know how much do I want to plan for this uncertainty and to what degree can I expect this uncertainty to be reduced into the future so yeah full of uncertainty this is a really complicated game and you know we've used fairly blunt instruments and we've uh, done what we can do at present and uh, the the errors are reported in the paper yeah I was speaking with Dr. William Lawrence and he is studying old growth tree die-offs, mainly in the Amazon. And a lot of our conversation was actually around the uncertainty. And I'm really, I don't want to say glad that you brought it up, but in a sense I am because I think it's really important for us to try to understand 
why it's so challenging to make predictions, why it's so challenging to understand the complexities that are compounding on each other. You know, I think about climate change models compounded with resource extraction, pollution, CO2, uh, you know, there's so many things. And like you were saying, we don't have thousands of years of data either. Um, and things are changing so rapidly and positive feedback loops feed into that. So there's so many angles in which to understand this. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really quite complex. And I'm appreciative that are, there's people like you that are focusing in and trying to make sense of this madness. And I was also thinking, you know, I know a lot of our listeners will be familiar with the finding that the world's average temperatures have gone up by one degree Fahrenheit in the last 50 years, but they might be less familiar with findings that show that the coldest night of winter has warmed by about seven degrees Fahrenheit. And other studies project that winter's coldest temperatures will warm up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050 to 2070. What is the importance of these nuanced findings? Are there other incredibly you know, powerful findings like the above that seem to get lost in the conversation or are not conveyed to the general public. And what does the loss of cold winter nights mean in terms of being a part of a range constraints for other forest insects? Yeah, so um, part, part of why we wanted to do this study is that we found that there is a bias towards considering the impacts of the warm side of climate change. And, you know, there's no surprise about why that would be the case. We were talking about the main term for what we now generally call climate change was global warming up until recently. And that's still a popular way to refer to what's going on with this. But, you know, as the climate warms, we lose winter. That's something that we need to pay attention to. Winter is not just this dead season where nothing happens. Winter is an extremely important part of the ecology in places where winter happens. And so, you know, this was one very immediate impact that we could see of uh, changing winter uh, extreme temperatures in this pretty cold part of the world. Another thing that tends to be concealed in discussions of global mean temperature warming, you mentioned one degree Celsius. Uh, you know, what, what does that even mean? Uh, we don't consider the weather ever in terms of the global average temperature. It's never reported on a weather report. No one really knows the impact of, of what that means. You know, does that, what, what's it like here when the global temperature is one degree warmer, for instance? No one has a sense of that. And so uh, you have to parse out these really policy oriented measures of warming into what they mean for weather. And when you do that, one interesting thing that happens is that one degree of mean warming does not mean one degree every single day at every moment across the whole year. It, is uh, disproportionately falls at certain points in the temperature distribution. It affects winter temperatures the most, and, and that's a bit of a mystery and is still being researched intensively. There are local effects that could be responsible for this, like snow cover. Uh, snow cover is very white, and it reflects back solar radiation and keeps it from uh, soaking into the ground and coming back out at night. So that could be one thing that is changing that could uh, amplify warming as we start to melt a little bit of that snow. Another thing that could happen is the circulational changes at the global scale. People might remember that last winter had, was a very warm winter overall, but had a couple weeks of extreme cold in North America and Europe. It was a very weird winter. And part of that was because of uh, these really anomalous circulations in the Arctic with these lobes of very cold air breaking away. And usually they would be strongly contained by uh, very fast winds that, that circulate around the, the Arctic like a fence. And some people say that this is a, an outcome of warming. It's pretty well established in the physics, but you know we're always limited by the, the lack of data we have and that a lot of our analysis and a lot of the way that we understand climate change in terms of the broader circulation of the atmosphere is through model experiments that we always have to ask whether they're doing simulate whether they're giving us the right answer or if they are giving us the right answer they're giving it to us for the right reasons so uh, the cold winter nights are important for various other insects there is some connection with 
another very prominent recent actually invasive so not native to north america uh forest insect pest uh, the emerald ash borer which is similarly chews into ash trees and kills them and this uh, was actually native to eastern Siberia and northern China. So it's actually relatively adapted to cold climates and winters. And it remains to be seen how warming winters would actually uh, improve its ability to spread across North America and pose a really continental threat to ash trees, which I really like ash trees. Uh, they're beautiful, straight, straight wood. And they are very popular, especially in Montreal, where I'm from. Uh, it's a popular urban horticultural tree that we plant all over the place. So it'd be really a shame to lose those. But not just insects. Uh, there are, in northern climates, most uh, most small mammals will spend the winter under the snowpack. And they create a network of tunnels and they go about their lives totally under the snow during the six months of the year that it's frozen. The uh, warming winters will certainly affect the, the dynamics and structure of that snow especially if you get a couple of really warm days that turn it into ice, uh, it'll definitely interact with the way that those mammals live under that snow during the winter. And I'll mention one other example that comes to mind is apples. Apples need a winter chill in order to flower, uh, as far as I understand. And so they really need it. And that's sensitive to uh, the, a cold night or two during the winter. That really gives them the chill that sets off the subsequent spring uh, flowering that that brings us these apples. So there are connections to insects and insect forest disturbances. There are connections to mammals. There are connections to the crops that we grow to eat. And uh, there there are connections all over the place uh, in the northern climates where winter has been shaping the ecology and the agriculture uh, for as long as people have been living there and as long as species have been around. Uh, a second part to that question, or at least staying on the topic of temperatures, I've read that annual minimum temperatures have played a large part in constraining beetle populations. It was cold winter snaps that initially killed the beetles in their larval stage and acted as a geographic threshold of sorts. Are there other cold, limited forest insects for which range constraints will no longer exist due to warming winters? Yeah, there are other uh, ones for sure. I believe the hemlock woody adelgid is another one, but I actually don't know that much about it. I mean, one very interesting thing is the question of uh, of what will happen with southern pine beetles' main predator, which is this beetle-eating wasp. And that is actually native also, as, in addition to the south where southern pine beetle uh, is from, but also feeded on different species of beetles in the north in the United States. So it can survive cold temperatures to some degree, uh, and it'll just eat other things. Uh, so when the circumstances are different, the other species of beetles and other species of trees are present, um, you know, this interaction between this predator and its prey could be totally different, and that just completely remains to be seen. It's, it hasn't been researched yet. In doing research for this interview, I read that Europe has a stronger chance of preventing the spread of tree-killing pests, similar to the southern pine beetle, because their forests tend to be more, you know, quote, actively managed and fragmented. So in terms of adaptive strategies, land managers have practiced cutting out infested trees as well as thinning. But I'm really actually weary of the discussion around adaptive strategies as it seems to curtail the conversation we should be having. You know, a serious critique and retribution of the norms and values that got us here in the first place. So I'd like to ask you if you think these adaptive strategies will work under such serious predictions. And also more broadly, how do you feel about the techno fixes and adaptation strategies that are continuously brought forth following scientific reports that outline the reality of what we're facing? Uh, misguided, missing the point, and unlikely to succeed. The Southern Pine Beetle paper picked up some media attention when it came out in the Northeast. And uh, so I did maybe a dozen media interviews on it. And I tried to make a very strong point 
um, when every interviewer brought up what kinds of adaptive strategies forest managers were considering to prevent the spread. I really tried to emphasize that, well, you know, we caused this problem. And this is a part of the world where we have caused the brunt of the problem because this is a very wealthy, high consuming part of the world that has been burning fossil fuels for, uh, you know, th throughout the Industrial Revolution and beyond. So, I mean, really, we have made a choice to live this lifestyle that causes these uh, slew of problems, uh, one of which is greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. And now we have in our backyard the impacts. And, you know, compared to sea level rise in low lying coastal areas in countries that don't have the most resources to relocate or bolster those coastal environments, um, you could say that this is not the most life threatening or livelihood altering impact. So there's a, there's a disconnect between the severity of the impact and who causes this problem. And, you know, so from an equity perspective, and also from the perspective of really going to the root cause of what's of this problem, um, we need to talk immediately about what actually causes it. And I remain convinced, you know, you can make arguments about this just being a problem of the, of the, the system itself and the dynamics of investment and the uh, infrastructure, the lifespan of fossil fuel infrastructure, and that there's this inertial phase where individual will can't really do anything. But ultimately, I really think that the, the fossil fuel emissions are driven by, by people who use goods and have large houses and drive cars and things like that. And only one of maybe 12 interviews that I did actually, actually reported that I said this, and that was uh, Vice Motherboard. So hats off to Vice Motherboard for uh, actually, interestingly, Vice is a relatively youthful uh, news outlet. So maybe it's just a generational thing that we will uh, we are more preoccupied with the root cause because we know uh, as young people that that the problem will persist as long as we can continue to cause the problem. So yeah, I, you can you can tinker with the forests, you can cut buffer zones all you want, but there's just going to be something else that's going to interfere with the system. And as I, as we've been discussing. Uh, it's really hard to foresee what those impacts are going to be. And I can really imagine that our technical adaptations will have consequences that uh, will spiral into the general chaos and uh, complexity of these systems. And so really, why not just avoid the problem? We can do this if we put our minds to it. And we're really responsible personally at the level of our consumption and in how we vote and in how we get out on the streets. That's really what it all comes down to, I think. Yeah, I I really couldn't agree more. I think, of course, we can talk about buffer zones and thinning, but if we're not actually going to look at what created the issue in the first place, we're just... Um, I actually think Derek Jensen said this quote during our interview years ago, but he had made this metaphor of um, somebody coming in like a, a stabbed victim coming into an emergency room and the doctors are trying to sew up his wounds, but then there's somebody still stabbing him. And so, you know, we can try to do these restoration techniques, which I think, and and not that I'm actually that into the the thinning restoration techniques. I think there's a lot of issues there and I think it's mostly actually about money and getting more timber for the logging industry but I do feel like yes yes we should be doing restoration measures but we do need to be looking at the root cause and I do think the millennial and younger generation we are inheriting such a complexly you know we're, we're inheriting this very oof I have a lot of words in my mind, but an earth that is really in trouble. And we have to be thinking about things differently. And, and you know, I also was thinking about what you were saying about consumption. And I think it's so interesting to see our human minds jump to these thoughts of, oh, we can, we can, you know, do this techno fix. We can do that. We can do that. Um, we can blame these people. We can blame those people. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. But we never actually just want to turn it around on ourselves because it's really challenging to do so and say, oh, wow, am I still consuming? Am I still buying that plastic case of pineapple when I live in New York City in the winter or whatever time? Am I still pumping ExxonMobil fuel in my car, Shell, BP, doesn't matter? And 
I know for me, I even think to myself a lot, gosh, it feels actually crazy to be conscious in my body embodying two very different, kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde of like this one person who really wants to have integrity and just be in reciprocity with the earth. And then this other part of me, this modern person who has a computer and a microphone and an iPhone and, you know, has a car and all of these things, it's, it's really challenging. And I don't, I don't think it's a reason to be debilitated, although I know I even go through my own bouts with that. But just to all kind of sit in the dichotomy together and go, okay, this is what it is. And how do we move forward from this place rather than trying to find false solutions or trying to blame other people when we know that in some way we're all complicit in the system. And yes, it is a systemic issue, but we also all uphold that system. And so how do we how do we get out of it? And I don't have the answers, but it's a question that I ask all the time of guests, of myself, of the forest. Um, so I'm really, I'm really happy that you went there with it. Hats off to Derek Jensen for, for always having the appropriately urgent and visual metaphor yeah. on hand. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that the earth is in trouble. And I, I want to talk about that because I, I'm in a department that deals with long time scales. There are geologists, there are paleoclimatologists and paleoecologists and and, you know, I, I don't think the earth is in trouble, actually. I think the earth is fine. Our place is in it is in trouble. And people are of this earth. You know, we are through and through and through of the earth. We come from here. And it's really a question of whether we want to we wanted to continue to have a reasonable kind of existence in, on this planet and to be embedded in it uh, in a way that that is conducive to our existence. If we uh, make this place unhospitable to us, the, the planet will rebound. Uh, the planet, this this will be a blip. Uh, we've changed it a lot, but but lots of things have changed the planet a lot. And a lot of things that have changed the planet a lot in the billions of years of Earth history have not been around. They didn't continue to succeed. So it's a question of whether we want to have a successful life. And and so I really want to emphasize that. This is, this is not a purely benevolent thing. I think when you see this correctly, you see that there's you're not doing a service to the planet. There's there's no difference between doing a service to to ourselves as humans and doing a service to the broader community of species that we're part of. But really, at the end of the day, we're the ones who are going to go. Uh, everything else is going to shift a bit, but it, it'll come back and be vibrant once again. Um, and you also talked about this difference between seeking a better harmony and a more uh, contemplated life, and then this tension with modernity. Well, you know, I don't think the consumption is fundamentally human. Uh, I think there are lots of expressions of human culture and history uh, that uh, were not consumptive and actually had antagonistic ideas towards consumption. Um, and, you know, I think we can learn a lot from the diversity of human culture and, and human conceptualization of life and the world. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that clarification of the human mind. I guess what I meant to say is this modern capitalist consumer addicted we to go mind and yeah and i i gosh in terms of like is the earth going to be okay it's a topic that i've gotten into a lot and think about um you know deep time geological time like you had mentioned and sure you know, the earth wasn't the same a billion years ago. The dinosaurs went extinct. Yeah, we can look and see that there has been, this is the sixth mass extinct, extinction. So, of course, we do know on some level that this, in a sense, something similar maybe has happened before. It's hard, though, for me to say the earth will be okay, even though I said the earth isn't okay. And, and I know I can I can see the a juxtaposition in that. And I... I don't know, it's kind of like that same tone when I hear people who talk about wildlife conservation and they go, oh, no, no, like the population is healthy. It's like the population is healthy to who? Like who is the population healthy to when there used to be billions of salmon and now a healthy population could be deemed a couple thousand? It's like, well, how is that healthy for like, is are you asking the salmon that? Are the salmon saying that there's enough of them? You know, there's like this, there's this uh, human supremacist, animistic mind that I kind of go in between. And not that I can speak for these creatures, but I do feel like 
just the whole mindset of what we do think is okay and not okay and what we think is healthy, not healthy, what we think is enough nature, enough wilderness to sustain what are we trying to even, do we even want to sustain civilization? I mean, I know I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but it kind of just, it just took me there, this mini conversation within the pine beetle conversation. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I sit with the challenge of that thought of will the earth be okay, whatever okay is, and losing so much biodiversity doesn't feel okay to me. You know, watching the glaciers melt rapidly, watching the salmon collapse, watching grizzly bears collapse, watching, you know, I, I could go on and on and on, and we both could. There's something, it's almost like, it's not so much, it will the earth be okay. It's almost this question of, why is it not okay that this is how it's going down or something like that. And I know this is kind of this unanswerable, this unanswerable conversation that we really can't get to the bottom of, but it's definitely piqued a lot of <laughs> passion in me just thinking about this chain of thought. I, I think it is answerable really. And the, the task for, for our generation and for our children and our children's children is to, to question our culture and uh, to think about what we want our lives to be. Uh, I think we've been led down a dead end uh, in this conceptualization of life, this understanding, and we need to we need to change that. And we can change that. And we've changed attitudes before. You know, we, as, as I said, diversity of human expressions. Um, and the, you know, the really sad thing is we are we are a peculiar species. People, uh, we are not just like any other species. Uh, we are very dexterous and very very smart and uh, very, very social in very, very complex ways. Uh, and we think about ourselves in very, very complex and deep ways. And it's just it's just kind of sad and dumb. You know, we, we're, we can do better than this. And I think that's really the challenge. That's where we are, uh, is, to, is to not let the human legacy and what it means for this planet to have had a species like us up until this point, to let that just be such an utter and sad failure that we got into this you know, this uh, little pit that we couldn't get ourselves out of because we just couldn't imagine a life that was reasonable. By the rivers of Brown, where he sat down, then there This other thought, I know prior to this interview, you had mentioned an interest in thinking about the cultural and social side of the climate problem as someone who is from the scientific trenches. And in response to this, I'm curious about what you think are the limitations for scientific research, or what does all of this research mean for how we can live and structure our social and economic lives? Well, I think science plays a relatively minor role you know, on one hand, science is one way that we uh, understand the world. It's a way of taking uh, all of the 
data that's available to us. And, and data is just kind of whatever we can perceive ourselves as humans or through our tools to try to make sense of it. But it's, it's a very ideological and a very simple way of understanding things. Um, you can only really analyze what you can neatly quantify. And that kind of runs into the boundaries of, of what science can really talk about and what science is willing to talk about within the culture of science. So I struggle with this because I spend my time training as a scientist. Um, but I think we know what we need to know about, especially on the mitigation and emissions side of things, about what uh, climate change really entails. So then I am left to think about, you know, what really is the role of science and what is the utility of the work I do? And this is part of the reason I work on adaptation questions mostly, uh, questions of how we can prepare for and anticipate the impacts because, you know, working on simply forecasting impacts or accounting uh, for the economic uh, and technical drivers of emissions always kind of leads you into the the uh, frustration of the political impasse that we're in right now in terms of having uh, the basis of power, the locus of power being in state governments uh, that are relatively inert and ineffectual on this on this problem. Um, so yeah, there, I think there's a role for science, but I, I think scientists are a bit frustrated if they realize the limitations of their field um, or they're a little bit, you know, too ideological about what science can do for us. I mean, we have to keep in mind that science is part of the social concept of life that really bolsters the attitudes of continuous material progress and technical advancement that has caused this problem. Uh, and I think we need to be very, very critical about our the mythology surrounding science and progress when science uh, meets this this problem and this field of specialization. Uh, this may sound curt, what I'm about to say, but do you really see scientific research around climate change and extreme weather events as a motivating factor for change? I know and it's it just seems like, when things are so obvious that dominant society and the scientific field itself suffers from such a limited view of nature because we have imbued values like profit and war and domination onto the natural world, do you think that this research is really going to shift people? I think it does inform our understanding of the world. And, uh, and you know, one field that I really admire is ecology because I think ecology ecology is a relatively young discipline. And it's made an effort to be non-ideological about, about what it says about nature to some degree. And it also attracts people who are very open-minded towards the, the broader meaning of ecology as a science and what the system that it's trying to understand, if you can even call it a system. And you know, one way that this is the case is, is that you know, from pretty early on in ecology's history, it tried to uh, dismiss the misconception of evolution as some kind of arrow into the future of species where, you know, Everything leads to us, basically, um, and to think of things more as this distributed web of really, you know, complicated gene exchange and, you know, relative fitness and population dynamics. And then when it comes to people, uh, social dynamics or, or even some other species have the social interaction with their own evolution. And so you know, I think that has informed an understanding of the world that is closer to the reality, which is that everything is linked and uh, systems are just kind of uh, you, participants in nature are all just kind of in this bath of uh, interaction. And so this atomizing worldview where things are broken down and reduced has been challenged a little bit from within science itself, which is kind of the original cultural proponent of that way of thinking about things that leads you into seeing right off zones of the world as a legitimate way to consider nature. And then I, I really agree with you that the alarmism in climate impacts research uh, is a bit of a predicament. For one thing, I think this is paralyzing to a lot of people. A lot of people are just kind of hopeless about what is happening here. And I don't necessarily think that's a reason not to do this research. I think we need to be careful about how we interpret the meaning of the research, which is, number one, we to some degree, climate changes has already happened and will continue to happen based on where we are in time right now. And going into the future, I don't see technically much cause for hope to think that there won't be at least two degrees of climate warming by, uh, say, 2100. 
And so we need to know what the impacts are going to be. And people are very adaptable and we can do that. Um, but also we need to we need to see these looming alarming kinds of risks as as things that motivate us to to do this change. And I think I think it's up to us to not be paralyzed by this. I think it's up to us to be, especially people who are, you know, in the high consuming parts of the world that are really responsible for this, to not be paralyzed and to say we need to do the work that's that's really ours to do to move through this. But yeah, I can definitely see uh, how seeing paper after paper come out, high profile articles about how everything is uh, total catastrophe is is really pretty demotivating. And you can definitely ask that question. And a lot of people struggle with it. Yeah, yeah, it's, I've seen science work in a sense to change things like, it's really interesting, but a lot of government agencies are funding, they need to see the science before they can actually either give money or put on stricter regulations. And it's kind of frustrating to see in terms of species collapse. And then let's say they're tribal members or community members or scientists having to do all of this work for years just to prove that <laughs> tailings ponds that are spilling into the river are affecting salmon populations or something like that. Obviously, salmon is um, one of my <laughs> my dearest kin, so I always think about them. But yeah, it's I do see science making a difference in a lot of ways. And I also see people just being inundated and saturated, like the general public, for instance, saturated with information, whether it's misinformation, which there's a ton of that and has been for years, or more honest information. But nonetheless, I think people are still like, well, what do we do? Okay, the climate's warming or destabilizing, but how do I even, uh, how do I even take that into my daily life? How do I even work with that information? How do I embody that information? And I think that's been a huge challenge for myself and I know so many others. How do we take what we're learning and actually do something about it that's tangible and effective? And yeah, so that's definitely, maybe for our next conversation, we can go even further into that topic. But this has been really wonderful, Corey. Um, thank you so much, and I really appreciate the breadth of your thought process, not just around these pine forests and die-offs from beetles, but also just this wider, expansive view on science and culture and humanity. It's been a really wonderful conversation. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for listening to me. Thanks for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm audio producer Andrew Stores. The music in today's show was by Little Wings, and our theme music is by Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our host and founder, Ayana Young. Writing and research for this episode by Madison Magalski. Outreach and research, Francesca Glassbell, Aiden McRae, and Hannah Wilton. Podcast music, Carter Lou McElroy. Digital Community Organizing, Suzanne Dollywall and Aaron Wise. Graphic and Web Design, Erica Ekram. And Melanie Younger with Partnerships and Media. 